Welcome to AN in Depth. I'm so excited to be here with uh, Jennifer Woods. She is the Associate Director of the Public Affairs and Religious Liberty Department here in the headquarters of the Seventh Amnesty Church, and Orlin Johnson, who is the Director of Public Affairs and Religious Liberty Department, or one department to say, um, for the North American Division, and my colleague Sam, who's with me every week. Thank you for being here today, guys. We're going to talk about religious liberty. And how, um, we, if you've been paying any attention to the news, um, this is a, a phrase or words that get bantered around a lot. Um, and we thought it's time to come in and talk about it and what it is and how it applies us and how we as a church approach it. So I'm going to just start off by asking, as a church, a denomination who is invested in religious liberty, we obviously have departments focused on it solely. It's something that we're known for. When we when we start out these conversations, how do we sort of define that religious liberty? What do, what are we looking for? How do we kind of define this phrase or this? Um, sure. I so um, I, I'll start with a definition that's widely used, and this is from the Universal Declaration of, of Human Rights, and it's found mm -hmm. in Article 18. It talks about religious freedom, and it defines it as saying the following. It says, everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion, and that this right includes freedom to change his religion or belief, and freedom either alone or in community with others and in public or private to manifest his religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship, and observation. And to kind of distill that, I would say that religious liberty and religious freedom really means the freedom to worship freely or choose not to worship. Um, it's it's a very fundamental, basic human right. And it's one that kind what of undergirds our, our church as well. One of the why, things that... Why sorry. does it... Sorry, Jen, let me, let me no, it's okay. ask the historical question. I mean, isn't it a bit odd for a church to have such focus and for so long on religious liberty? Um, why, why does... The, how did we get to this point and why does it matter to Adventists so much? Orland, perhaps you could... Yeah, I think what's important in particular for the Seventh-day Adventist Church is when you're a religious group and you are not, quote unquote, large in membership numbers, it's very easy for people to look at your numbers to try to determine the question of credibility or authenticity. And therefore, that's why it was so important from a religious liberty standpoint that you really put an emphasis on the personal beliefs of an individual as opposed to the size of its denomination, the reputation of its denomination, because there's nothing that said that you should only be connected to religious organizations that are large and recognizable. It's your freedom to be able to engage in religious beliefs. So one of the things we have Adventists have done for a very long time is protecting that freedom, not just for seven day Adventists, but for all individuals who have quote unquote religious beliefs. And that's why it's always been so critical for us. Yeah. And and to kind of um, follow up on that a little bit, you know, as a church, as Seventh-day Adventists and believers of the great controversy, we do believe there will be a time when the free exercise of religion will be curtailed. And so we also look at it from that prophetic standpoint. So we're very interested in protecting not just our religious freedom and ability to worship freely, but all people's ability to worship, because we realize that, you know, once one individual or one groups is um, infringed upon, that can easily lead to our rights being taken away as well. That's something that's always been really beautiful to me. And I, I find that our members are very thoughtful and, and accepting of that because, you know, one of the things that we do as a department in communication is we give tours and we, you know, when we take them past the, the public affairs and religious liberty department, the Parle department, we're going to call it Parle from here on out because I'm not going to go through <laughs> this whole thing. So when we go past that and we say that, you know, this is the department that protects religious liberty for people around the world and not just for our rights, but for others. I think that there, I don't think people think about that that much, but I think you can, but when you, you, you say it to them, they're very proud of that, that we do protect the religious rights of others and that it, it's not just about us as Adventists. It's about everyone's ability to worship or not worship, as you said, the way that they their conscious tells them to. Um, I think that's such a beautiful thing that we do. And it's it's a uniting thing that we have with the world that we are protecting them as well. You think the Sabbath Sorry. had an impact on this? Because we are very different from um, other Christian denominations because we worship on a different day, mm -hmm. which has implications to 
your work life and to, you know, your whole life really changes how you live. Do you think that has had an impact since the beginning on, on trying to defend other people's religious liberty because we felt firsthand what it looks like when we don't have, uh, when we don't have that given to us? I, I think definitely, Sam. And I think, you know, I was going to mention IRLA, which is the International Religious yeah. Liberty Association. And that was founded in part, it wasn't in direct, um, it wasn't directly founded because of the, you know, we worship on Sabbath, but it was fun. It was founded um, after some laws were being proposed where um, some Sunday laws were being proposed and also um, some legislation that would say that the United States would be a Christian nation. And in response to that, we found it the first off, um, I think the, the North American or National Religious Liberty Association, which then changed its name, it became international and became the International Religious Liberty Association. And this is a group that has ties with the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It is an independent and, and non-sectarian organization, which is actually really beautiful because um, we have members and and who who are not Adventist, members who are not Christian. We have members who are um, non-believers whatsoever. But this group is is there to defend and promote and again protect religious freedom for all people everywhere. And this was in part a response because we saw that you know we we need to protect not just our rights as Seventh Day Adventists to worship on the Sabbath, but all people's rights to worship or not to worship um, freely. Hmm. That's really great. I think people probably don't know that. So that's really great information for people to have. Um, right now, obviously, I think it would be hard for us to have this conversation without talking about um, vaccines a little bit or the current COVID situation. Because throughout COVID, um, there has been, the word religious liberty has been talked about quite a bit. And it's not just that about vaccine mandates or, you know, I remember um, Orlin, you and Bettina were on towards the beginning of COVID when we were talking about churches being shut down, if right. you remember. And we were talking about how um, people were saying, oh, this is a, a religious liberty violation of churches being shut down. And well, no, because you can still worship. And so throughout this past two and a half years, we've, we've talked about, um, just religious liberty has been on everyone's mind. And so I guess when I, one of my first questions in regards to this is, you know, we have said that vaccines for the Adventist church is not really a religious liberty issue. It's a public policy issue. And how, how are we coming to those decisions in those terms? Because vaccines can be a religious, a, a freedom of conscience issue or a religious liberty issue. So how are we coming to these terms? Um, or decisions? Well, I, I think the key aspect of this is that this religious conscience, a personal religious conviction, actually is something that's personal. And therefore, it does not put any of us in the authoritative position to be able to tell someone that that's not what you really believe, or you're saying this because you believe something different. That being said, as somebody in the area of public affairs and religious liberty, if you come to me and tell me that's your belief, now, I'm going to do everything I can to support you from that standpoint, regardless of what my personal beliefs may be. So if you're somebody that believes, for example, that being in a position where you are mandated to take the vaccine is a violation of your personal religious beliefs, the law is set up in a way that the moment that that is what you believe, that there is a response that your employer is uh, required to engage in. And that's one of the things that we want people to know. These are your rights if this is what you believe. Now, one of the things that we do have to make clear to our church members, and I think we've done a pretty good job of it, Jennifer and her team and our team here, is to making clear that your religious exemption is not a denominational participation exemption. That's been probably the sticking point that you have people that would say, well, I'd like to get a letter from my church. I would like to get a letter from my organization. Well, the problem is, is every personal belief that you have may not be part of the fundamental beliefs of your organization. That doesn't mean I'm not able to protect your personal belief, but to put that now on Seventh-day Adventist letterhead that we are helping you with a specific belief is something that's very difficult to do. I told a group of presidents of conferences one day, if I did a poll and asked everyone how they celebrated the Sabbath, I bet I would find many different ways to come to that conclusion. 
So if I can come to the conclusion that it's so many different ways that we celebrate the Sabbath, you can imagine what individuals' personal beliefs would be like. And that's one of the things that we've worked on, and we wanted to make that clear. So if you believe this, we'll be able to help you. If you want to get vaccinated, that's fine as well. But being in a position where you understand it's your personal belief and not your denominational participation belief is the key. What an excellent explanation, Orlin. I loved it. It's very, it was very, I, I think we should write it down um, <laughs> and set it up as, a, as, as our response because we get this question all the time. And yeah. uh, Jennifer, I, I think I, you were going to say something. and I. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to say, you know, I think another thing people sometimes forget is that, yes, we have freedom of religion and it's one of our fundamental rights, but it's not an absolute right. It has to be balanced against these other interests. And so while, you know, Orland's correct, like we have, you know, if you have a requesting a, a religious exemption, then yeah, employers need to look at that, but they have to make a reasonable accommodation. They don't have to make full accommodation for everyone's, um, you know, personal belief, because that's just an untenable thing to do. There are other rights at stake and other interests at stake that have to be balanced against this very fundamental basic right. So Jennifer, I think one thing I do want to mention, you kind of alluded to it. We spent a lot of time making sure, for example, that governments and local governments in particular were not making certain rules and regulations. Like, for example, a grocery store can be at 50 percent and a church can only be at 25 percent. Mm -hmm. We spent a lot of time ensuring that there would be a fairness that would be a task across the board. And you would not be in a position where you would see that. As a matter of fact, in the state of Maryland, we went so far as to get the governor to actually say that those who engage in religious um, leadership um, actually should be considered essential services during a pandemic because you have all of these individuals that are going through these very stressful times and to basically put a limit on pastors and religious leaders during this time didn't make sense. So if you can have liquor stores open as a quote unquote essential service, it, mm. it just seemed like being able to see your pastor should have fallen into that category as well. Excellent. I, I want to lean in a little bit more into the denominational aspect of this. Uh, it seems to me as I've been observing this for years, that there are certain things that happen that we kind of look at each other and go, this is an issue for me. Is this an issue for you? And what about you? And what about you? And what about the world church? Because it's a very big church. I mean, we are small compared to some of the larger denominations, but we have to, there is also the aspect of the Adventist church that even though it's somewhat fragmented, it's pretty large. There are four Adventist churches for every McDonald's in the world, for example, you know, 2 million students. That already sets up a, a, a really large um, congregation, let's say. Um, so it, to the extent that, okay, so this is a religious liberty issue. It may be a religious liberty issue for me. It seems to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, that when that becomes a religious liberty issue at some level of abstraction to most Adventists, then it becomes, uh, and it, it is a reflection of our doctrine, say, of how we understand the Bible, our fundamental beliefs, and how we understand reality, mm -hmm. um, like the Sabbath that you mentioned. Not how we keep the Sabbath, but the ability of not working on Sabbath and in sustaining my family, etc., or worshiping on the Sabbath, etc., um, then it is possible to have the denominational help uh, on the letterhead. Or is that not something that we do? Because as a local church pastor, I used to do that. I used to write letters with a letterhead um, asking the employers to make accommodations for the Sabbath based on our doctrine. Is that what we do? Tell me more about that. Well, yeah, we still do that. And the reason that we do that on our letterhead is that the seventh day being the Sabbath is a fundamental part of our seventh day Adventist beliefs. The reason we wouldn't do it, for example, regarding vaccine mandates is that that, that, isn't. that category. So anything from a doctrinal standpoint that completely is foundational to what we believe, putting that on our church letterhead from a pastor's perspective and anything else would be perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. But the flip side of that is too, is that you as a pastor, and let's say we have 5,000 other pastors, we send you out a sample letter that you can work with. The likelihood that everybody's writing the exact same letter makes a difference. 
And although I don't practice law anymore and Jennifer has practiced it for a long time, one word here, one comma there, and now we've sent out a completely different message. Mm -hmm. So you know, it's even trickier when you're dealing with something that's not even part of our doctrine that we try not to have a lot of flexibility with. But even that, if I had my druthers, I would even slow that down just simply because a little bit of change in here and there. Mm -hmm. But from an optional standpoint, I think it's worth the risk. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess, you know, there's such a difference between um, lawyers and communicators because we don't. <laughs> and here's the difference. <laughs> um, I, I would like to talk a little bit about um, about us. Talk, you know, we, we've been talking about religious liberty um, and in the different ways that we use it. And I want to talk about the importance of it and the weight of our words. And I don't want to say that there is anybody, I, would, I wouldn't want to make the accusation that we are becoming too flippant with using religious liberty. Um, but it sometimes feels like um, as, as a, I don't want to say Seventh-day Adventist, but as a Christian, the current trend in Christianity, maybe evangelical Christianity, is to, to kind of use this phrase whenever it feels like you're not getting maybe what you want or things are going in another way. And I was wondering, how important is it to be careful in how we use this? I mean, you were just talking about this, Orland, to some extent, like, we're talking about the Sabbath, we're going to put that, we're going to stand behind it, we're going to put it on our letterhead, we're going to send that letter out that says, the denomination stands behind this, whereas something where vaccine mandates, that's something that we all have our individual beliefs on. It's something that, like, like you guys have said, will help if we can, in any way we can, but we're not going to put that on the letterhead or whatever. How important is it for us to be very careful in how we use it? Because as, as we go on, and we've touched on this a little bit, Jennifer, you mentioned prophetically, we know that this is something we're really going to have to stand behind and defend later. And if we, if we use this in a flippant manner, or we use this in a ca casual manner is the word I've been looking for for the past two hours. Um, in a casual manner, does it become less weighted? And people roll their eyes and they say, the Christians are out claiming religious liberty again. And what are some of the dangers that we might face if that's the case? Because I don't want to accuse anyone, but it's just, I feel like words matter. I'm a communicator. I believe words matter and the way we use them matters. And I, I would like to, to hear, you know, how, how can we be more cognizant on how we use that? And I, I agree with you, Jennifer. And I think, you know, um, you know, I live in the United States and like, we believe prophetically, you know, that at some point Christians, specifically Adventists or the remnant, there's going to be persecution. There's going to be a curtailment of um, freedom to exercise one's religion. But we're not facing that here now in the United States. But there are places in the world where people are facing persecution. And so I think, yes, when we use when we make those arguments, um, there's just to me, there's no there's not really a lot of comparison, you know, an inconvenience. Um, someone criticizing is not the same as being persecuted for your religion. There are people who are facing the death penalty because they are Christian or because they've converted to Christianity or because someone has accused them of blasphemy. That's not the same as, um, you know, you having to, to make certain accommodations or being criticized because someone doesn't believe the same thing you believe here in the States. No, I think it's still pretty scary uh, when you put in the numbers what um, what we're talking about here is about 80% of the world does not get to serve their God in the way that they see fit without person, 80%. And when you are starting to look at being in a globalized society, that the idea of, well, it's not in my backyard, so I shouldn't worry about it. The fact of the matter is in a global environment, if it's in somebody else's backyard, it could easily be in your backyard. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really where we have to stay on target, stay on point. And uh, I think Jennifer really just, you know, hit it on the head that sometimes in the United States, your feel is, well, that can never happen to me here. And yes, that's just something that happens someplace else. But I think part of our job is to stay on top of it wherever, it is. you know, injustice for one is injustice for all. And that's the, the hopefully the mantra we'll continue to work at on these issues. It's really interesting. Um, we've talked about on this program before um, different different situations. I, I remember we talked about Ellen White saying, and what I'm what I'm going to get at is our our conscience and how we 
how we sort of come to these freedom of, of religion um, topics and how we, you know, when you when you say, okay, we're not going to we're not going to go to church because the the government has said we're not supposed to be in buildings. How we sort of navigate these areas where we, I don't want to say disobey the government, but we maybe push back a little harder. And we've talked about before, you know, Ellen White said, you know, if the if the government says return a slave, you're not don't return a slave. That's just not morally what we do as Adventists. It's not morally what we do as Christians. And I feel like, you know, there have been situations in obviously in the Holocaust, in situations where Christians and Adventists have bumped up against what the state has asked them to do and then done the done a different thing and we applaud them and that's they've done what they should and i i don't wouldn't want to say that vaccines are to the same level as either of those two things but we are coming up you know we keep talking about this as prophecy religious freedom and prophecy and what you guys do they all come together and so when we're making our decisions and we're, we're like this is the hill i'm going to die on this is you know and some people have decided i guess vaccines are the hill they're going to die on or um, not going to, are going to church during COVID is the hill they're going to die on. Um, what would you guys in your, you are the experts, what, how do you sort of tell people or advise people and how we make those decisions? What do you see in people who have made those good decisions to stand up for other people and sort of disobey? Um, and what do you what what do you see in them and how they make those decisions N not encouraging anyone again i don't want people to watch us and be like um ann has encouraged me to break the law that's not what i'm saying what i am saying is there are times when our conscience is important and we have to stand up for what we believe in in the face of oppression and these different things so jennifer you look like you're about to say something no i mean it's interesting because i was just i was thinking about this issue a couple of weeks ago um, when I was writing something and it was, it was basically on civil disobedience and mm -hmm. on when we are called to be civil, dis you know, to, to obey the civil authorities. And I think that as Christians, there are times when we are called to civil disobedience and I want to define it. So I, I do have it written because I want to make sure I'm very clear on what I mean yes. when I say civil disobedience. And so for purposes of this discussion right now, what I mean when I say civil disobedience is purposeful, nonviolent action that it, or refusal to act. Um, by a Christian or person of faith who believes that that action or inaction is required in order to be faithful to God. And we, and the person knows that it will be treated by the government as a violation of the law. And then the other piece to that is then a willingness to face the penalties, right? So it's not just disobeying the governing authorities, but it's also knowing, okay, this is in violation of governing authorities, and I could face a penalty from, from this action or inaction. And they're biblical examples of civil disobedience, right? Starting, you know, um, even in the time of Exodus and the midwives refusing to kill the babies that Pharaoh said, kill the male, the male babies when they come out. But really, when you look in the book of Daniel, you see twice, you know, two examples of civil disobedience that I think we can, can look at as examples as Christians, right? With um, the three Hebrews and not bowing down when the music was played and also in Daniel and continuing to pray when that was again against the law of the land. And in both of those instances, we saw that they weren't trying to change the law. They knew what the law was. They were definitely disobeying the law and they were willing to face the penalty of that disobedience. And so I think that, you know, given that context and that definition, then yeah, there are times and there will be times as Christians that we will be faced and that our, and that our obligation really should be to disobey the civil authorities. You know, I think the, the interesting part that, um, that Jennifer is alluding to that what I would call modern day individuals that want to engage in, in civil disobedience is they are very comfortable with the part of going against. They're uncomfortable with the part of the potential punishment that comes mm -hmm. with that. You know, mm -hmm. most people are getting more cognizant of is if you do want to stand up, if you do want to get counted, that is not always going to lead to some, you know, um, champion of the change that people want to see. You're going to find someone who's going to say, you're violating the law, and this is a punishment that comes with it. So for those who actually want to stand up, and, and even, and it's not quite the same, but some of the individuals who were saying, well, I'm not going to be vaccinated, and this is the accommodation, but I don't like that accommodation either. Well, you know what? When you stand up, you don't always get what you want. Sometimes you have to deal with what you get. And, you know, 
And if you truly are believing that you're doing what God asked for you to do, then the Lord is going to protect you. But even in that protection, you know, three Hebrew boys did go into the fiery furnace. Daniel did go into the lion's den. God still protected them. But the consequence of your choices, you know, will sometimes lead you to be in some very perilous situations. And even yeah. if he doesn't free us from your hand, O king. Absolutely. Um, it does not mean, however, that we cannot advocate our case. Absolutely. And Absolutely. That's, that's precisely what we do. We advocate our case and the case of others, uh, but to the point that there are consequences, as Jennifer pointed out, there are parts of the world that because people follow Jesus, because they become Seventh-day Adventists, uh, they're fearful for their lives. And in the past, people have lost their lives because of that. Now, the good news is, and it seems very cold and disheartened to say this now, but we believe that that's not the end. And the end is when God recreates this earth and the judgment is in his hands. So, and that's, that's something actually that N.T. Wright mentions mm. uh, based on Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10 where God says the pur purpose of the church is to remind the rulers and authorities um, in the heavenly realms, but I think it also applies here, as N.T. Wright believes it applies here, that the purpose of the church is to remind the rulers that there is a judge and it's not them. Mm -hmm. It's to say, you know, there is a king of kings. Watch out, king. There is a king of kings, and you will answer to him. Um, and and that's that's a reminder that perhaps the church should never ignore that we do have a part to play in civil society, which is to point out even when it is inconvenient. And the New Testament is full of it. The book of Acts is the full inconvenience of the kingdom of God to the kingdom of man. And That's even true. in that, the, the one of the main characters, let's say, one of the main, it's not a character because characters are fictional. One of the main people in the book of Acts is the apostle Paul who says, honor Caesar even as he's kicked out from city to city and he's beaten and bruised because he's exercising his, um, his religion. And he sings praises in the prison. You don't see him complaining. And then the prison doors are open and he tries to save the jailer. This is Acts 16. And the next day he says, but I'm a Roman citizen. And everybody's terrified. Should he not have mentioned that before? It turns out he, he's not. I don't know what Paul was thinking. I mean, he's, he's an odd guy let's say because he waits until the next day and he is willing to suffer so others can be saved and that's that's very much like jesus and um jennifer uh, uh stymus that is <laughs> why don't you bring up that story from the airplane i think that's such a weird story we should at least make reference to it what happened on that airplane on easter sunday oh gosh yeah, I mean, I if you if you are paying attention to the news right now, I think this is a big story. I at first saw it, I think, on Twitter, and now I read it on NPR. So NPR being um, the National Public Radio, which is now not just nationally public radio, is it? Um, <laughs> but it's a story of a, a group of Christians who were on a plane um, over the weekend, and I they were decided to pull out their guitar and sing to the plane gospel songs, and when um, one of our representatives who is actually Muslim said something about her family doing prayer, you know, on the plane, how it would then somebody else will, you know, if she doesn't like the religious freedom that we have here, then she should go back to her country. Um, saying that this was a religious liberty situation. And I don't know, the four of us travel quite a bit when there's not COVID. I don't know how any of us would feel about someone pulling out their guitar and singing on our planes. Um, but, but when we talk about this, is this a religious liberty infraction that, you know, because I think that people hear, I can worship anytime I want and anywhere I want, and that's what religious freedom is. And, and it's an interesting, you know, when we talk about this situation, we talk about these situations, it, it's balancing our rights against other people's rights. Isn't that what it is? Isn't that what the story is um, about the plane? Well, I, I I think, yeah, go ahead. And I think Jennifer actually kind of alluded to it earlier. Yeah. Your religious freedom is not an absolute right. You know, it's not a right that you can pull out on any given moment that you'd like to utilize it because at the same breath, you know, you also still 
are in a country where you have to respect the rights of others. Right. And so when my right that personally belongs to me gets to a point where it subsumes the rights of all the other people around me, then I've gone too far. Because now I'm using my religion not as a shield, but I'm using it as a club, you know, and you start using it as a club and a sword to, you know, poke others or to beat others or to make a point to others. And the moment you decide to pull out your guitar and start singing out loud, you're more than just making a point to yourself, you're making a point to others. And I think as Christians in particular, sometimes we have to remember that we are not the totality of all religions. And therefore, we can be offensive to some degree if you go past it in a way in which you're forcing others to be a part of something they wouldn't want to be a part of. If somebody on the plane started having a seance and claiming that they were in the midst of their devil worshiping, you know, I would be uncomfortable with that as well. And I'd want somebody to put an end to it now you do what you want to do, but once it starts impacting me, then that's another whole situation. So that's my perspective. Yeah. One of the things that I've been wanting to study now for three years and I've, I haven't had a chance is the development of human rights. Because up until the early 20th century, it seems that uh, rights were established in the negative. So I have the right not to have property taken from me. You see, it's established in the negative. I don't have the right to have, um, another way to say it is, I have the right to have property, which could be interpreted as uh, people need to give me property, whatever that means. Um, so then in the latter part of the, of the last century, we had a lot of rights being established in the uh, positive, which some countries started doing. I'll give you an example. It is a human right to have access to public health. But is it? So then you become, okay, in that particular country, maybe they have a system that every human has access to public health. But if it becomes like Britain, where I lived most of my life, so that's a, let's say that's a British right. Okay. But is it a human right? Because that requires someone else doing something for you. You mm -hmm. see the difference? It's yeah. the in the positive and in the negative. In the positive, if I have that right, I need I demand, but immediately, if that's my human right, I demand that other people set up that for me and help me. And I have no responsibility in that process. So this I wanted to study this because the European Court of Human Rights has a lot of different um uh different uh, rights established in the positive. And there are many issues that are that have come out of this. For example, um, this was highly influential in Brexit. There was a Romani family, or I, th I think it was a, um, this is uh, commonly referred to as gypsies. And they were traveling through Europe and they settled on a protected piece of land in Britain. And the British are very particular about land. If you fly over Britain, it's just green fields and every inch of your own property. You can only build if you're given permission to build and it's etc. And suddenly this protected land in a village somewhere is taken over by gypsies and the British court established that they should be removed from there. But the European Court of Human Rights established that they have uh, the rights to live there because of uh, that is their way of life. And it spoke to one of the rights. I don't remember now. I'm bringing this up from years ago, reading about it. It's one of their European court, one of the human rights, according to the European Court of Human Rights, establishes that they have the right to remain in that land. And it is now, as long as they want to stay, their land. And the British went ballistic. It goes against Britishness uh, to, to have this there. And so there was a tension between now European human rights courts are telling us what to do over here. And, and that was part of the Brexit conversation and the Brexit debate. You know, what is it that is a human right as opposed to a local law and regional law? So this subject has fascinated me for years. So now you mention an absolute right. Um, what are absolute rights and how do they 
you know, do, the, do all rights compete and there is no such thing as an absolute right or is there? I don't know. I'm, I don't know if you have anything to hand about that, but that would be an interesting way to, to see religious liberty within that context. Well, I mean, I mean, Jennifer, you can go ahead. I, you had mentioned. No, that. no, I was going to let you go. If you... <laughs> no, I mean, because I, I was going to say no. I, I was going to say no right is absolute. I think they all have limits to them. And the moment that those rights begin to infringe on someone else's rights, even if it is a fundamental right, then you've kind of reached that limit. So yeah. um, that's my answer to that question. Without having that extensive study me. into the base, you know, the basis uh, of fundamental human I rights. Agree. Um, I think, though, it's kind of interesting when you take a look at, you know, how laws are crea created in the United States. Much of it has been kind of juxtaposed against how laws were kind of set up um, among the British. So many of our laws are not necessarily shaped by simply a negative point of view. They usually cover both aspects of it. Like even when you think about the Constitution, it talks about we the people. I mean, that statement in and of itself is contrary to almost any other constitution that you might deal with, because normally it becomes the protection of the government, the protection of the crown, and that is usually the fundamental aspect of it. So the moment you start off in creating an environment where the focus is on the people, and it's not on the status, and it's not on leadership, everything is going to run amok, because the people come in so many different thoughts and processes. So... The idea that we say you should be allowed to have free speech, you should be allowed to have freedom of religion, you should be allowed to have freedom of the press. But as Jennifer is saying, that no matter what that freedom is, there is a limitation on it. And I think that's the tough part of freedom. That's also the tough part of capitalism. You know, in a yeah. capitalist society, the, the long and the short of it is there are winners and there are losers. And the best way to demonstrate that you are a winner is to point out who the losers are. And creating a losing class is an easy way to determine who the winners are. And most people are not comfortable with that concept, but in capitalism, I don't know if you can look at it any other way. And that's not a very Christian point of view. So on one hand, you call you know this a Christian nation, but can you be a Christian nation and be a capitalist nation all at the same time when it's about winners and losers and who has and who doesn't have. And the idea that most people think that it's it's one of those situations that if I give you some of what I have, that means I am really losing out to some degree. That there's only one amount of the pie. And if I give you more of it, that must mean I have less of it. Now that's not really the truth, but that is the concept and it's easy math to see. And it's easy math to sell. And that's why some of the dynamics we're dealing with, we're continuing to deal with. And, and then that's how we feel about rights, because if I give up my right of religion, then then you have something that I don't have. And we see this, you know, like we talked about freedom of speech. You have freedom of speech. You can say whatever you want, but you cannot, we have hate speech. You cannot be discriminatory or and and also you you have to suffer consequences like sometimes i feel like people say you're taking away my right and but what, what you're really doing is saying you have consequences for behavior right yeah. like mm -hmm. you have the right to say whatever you want that doesn't mean you don't have consequences now that we're looking at what you're saying so that's if you if you are hateful in your speech and society says hey that's not the way we talk to each other anymore you have the right to say it but society has the right to say like, yeah, but we're gonna, you have consequences. You have the right of religion to worship however you have or however you want. But when you start infringing on other people's rights to worship or other people's rights to live safely, then we say, hey, you know what? We're not gonna do that anymore. And you have the right to write whatever you, and you're a journalist, you said freedom of press. Yeah, we have freedom of press, but we can't print lies. You can be sued for that. So. So there are consequences to behavior that is not appropriate, that we as, as a group have said, this is over the line. A lot of times it is the minority that needs to focus on religious liberty and, and various rights. As Orlin, you pointed out, it's because we're, we were very small at the beginning that we, we paid attention to this. You don't worry about the rights of the majority because generally the majority is the one setting those laws anyway. Right. So um, th there is a there is a philosophy that determines that that puts it this way. 
that the only true reality is love. In the absence of love, we need ethics. In the absence of love, we need laws. So, for example, maternity laws. If the employer was the father of the employee and she was pregnant and the father loved her as a father should, there is no need to pick up the policy book because the employer will give as much time as she needs and the employee would not take more than is necessary. Um, whatever that means, because there is love. Now, where there is no love, then we right. need ethics. How would you act if you did love? It seems that all of our, um, all of the best laws and, and policies are built on those principles. But what does that even mean exactly? So when Jesus lived, especially his ministry, those three and a half years we know a lot of stories about, it's hard to imagine a ruler like the Romans uh, today, because the Romans had all sorts of different rights that none of the other people had. Equality before the law was not a reality in the first century Palestine. Mm -hmm. Romans had one treatment and Jews had another set of, of, of treatments. And Jesus deals with this, and I'm not sure, you know, this wouldn't be a religious liberty issue, but Jesus deals with this inequality in the law by offering to face the consequences more than is demanded by the law. Sure. And I find this to be absolute genius, especially in that civil disobedience that you mentioned, uh, Jennifer. You know, you've got, okay, a, a Roman soldiers can force you to carry their burden for one mile. At the end of that mile, turn to them and say, would you like me to walk a second one for you? You completely remove the power of the state when you voluntarily face the consequences. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one way of, you know, if, if somebody hits you, a soldier could hit somebody without any, any problems. And you turn and you offer, do you need me to hit on the other side as well? Mm -hmm. So there is, there is one element of this that is you will assume unfairness and would live the consequences of your choice. Now, this is not desirable all the time, but there are some times, there are some situations where this is a way to change, to change those uh, scenarios from the bottom up. So what does that mean? The Roman Empire allowed you to have your freedom of religion in any province they conquered because they wanted to keep the Pax Romana, the, the Roman peace. In fact, Caesar, his main point was, I am going to bring peace to the world. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to conquer this territory. I'm going to put leadership in that territory. I'm going to keep the factions away, and there will be peace in that territory. So they can worship who, whoever they like, however they like. It will be fine. And they wanted to provide as much religious freedom as possible to keep the peace. The only religion that the Roman Empire persecuted was Christianity. And this is remarkable. And again, this is one of my list of things to, to research. But I, I need too many hours to do for this one. Because what is it that was so different about Christianity that led the Roman Empire to persecute it and to try to destroy it? They didn't do that to the Jews. They didn't do that to the pagans. They didn't do that to the Eastern religions. They over. They didn't do that to the Druids in England. They didn't do that to anybody. Why Christianity? What was it that was so shocking? And 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 I think that's what Jesus was doing. He was creating disciples that would shake the Roman Empire to its core and any kingdom thereafter. It is impossible for you to have true power when you have true Christians that you are leading because for them it's either freedom or death in many degrees they challenge the status quo in a different way because they are not political and they don't seek power um and so how do you deal with people like that it's right. it's very complicated right um so those are some thoughts about this this tension that we've been talking about 
but Sam, I think you, you really hit on it. I mean, when you are dealing with a group of people in which your whole focus is about power and control and authority, and their whole focus is about, I just want to serve uh, my God the way we like, and you can keep your power and keep your authority, <laughs> but just give me Jesus. That's a group you have to be afraid of because... <laughs> You no longer, I mean, the Roman Empire was about leverage. You know, part of the reason that they would let you live any way that you wanted to with your religion, because the leverage was you were still under Roman authority. Christianity made it very clear. Even if you let us do whatever you want to do, we will never be under your authority. You can call it whatever you want. You can color it however you want but we're not going to be under your authority. And when you don't have control over the heart and minds of, of individuals that you believe you have control over, you can't sleep at night. And I think that is really what was the, the onus. But, but the flip side of that, Sam, which is really interesting, many of the laws that we have to kind of look at today came into play because society through the church was not treating people fairly. The government never wanted to be involved in marriage and divorce and a number of those type of things. But what happened when the church was in charge of it, women always lost. Hmm. Certain groups that were always in a position where they were going to lose because of who they were and who they knew. That's why then government came in and stepped into those areas where the church that originally had the power, primarily through the Roman Catholic Church, started making choices and decisions that became clearly unfair. And trying to now find the balance was where you see all of these laws now that came in to give you these inalienable rights. And so it's an interesting dynamic where on yes. one you have this quote unquote absolute authority, but on the other hand, if you can't change the hearts of man, your authority is still only a shadow. <laughs> and therefore yeah. you no idea when they'll rise up and decide to do something about it. Two thoughts I had. I, I love what you're saying. The first thought is, what fascinates me is the people that were pushing the government to create those laws were mostly Christians. It is precisely because of what they read in scripture that they were um, now influencing the state to take over the things where the church had oppressed instead of liberated. Mm -hmm. So it's it's fascinating because it's easy to blame Christianity simply because the the church that accumulated power was doing things that were wrong. But it's, mm -hmm. it's in, to to a great degree, it is precisely Christians, disciples of Jesus, who were in positions of influence in governments that were pushing for this for that very reason. Mm -hmm. The second thing that I came to my mind is, and this is very scary, we are so polarized today that a lot of people that proclaim religious liberty, what they really want is to push a particular political point of view so that that view gains power. Mm -hmm. But Christians shouldn't play the power game. That's not what we do. You can't read the gospels and conclude that what we really should do is to gain power. It's that's not it. In fact, after the resurrection, when Jesus was about to be to in the ascension, the disciples asked, is this when you're going to restore the kingdom? And Jesus is like, I've I've died for them. I've been with them for 40 days after my resurrection and they still don't get it. Let me summarize it for you. Is it power that you want? OK, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We don't, playing the power game and using religious liberty to move a, 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 a given party, whatever that party may be, is not a good game. And I call everything a game. So it, sometimes people get offended. I, I, any, any social dynamic, I call it a game. This is not what we do. And this is probably why the Adventist church is very allergic to political partisanship or using pulpits as as political you know stages we are very allergic to this um in fact it is it, there are very few examples that i've heard stories i heard when our pulpits were used for political campaigns 
uh, because usually it does not that the pastor that allowed it does not last long <laughs> if they continue with it. So um, tell us about maybe Jennifer, you could tell us about that, how we deal with with the political um, world, because there are many countries in the world that go through uh, campaigns uh, this year, for example, Brazil, I'm Brazilian. Brazil has a election this year, and it is as contentious as the previous American election was um, in, in, in for much the same reasons. But the church remains outside of that as much as it possibly can. Tell us more about that dynamic. Yeah, I, I want to step back one second to something you said earlier, and that's the misuse of religious freedom and religious liberty. And, and something that Orlin said, you know, as far as religious liberty and religious freedom is supposed to be a shield, right? It's supposed to protect people so that they can worship freely or choose not to worship without repercussions. And instead in this climate, what we've seen um, is this misuse of religion. So it's become, you know, Orland said a club and, you know, people say a, a sword so that it harms people's other people's rights or it's no longer promoting the common good. And, and I think that, you know, we look at this issue of entangling politics and faith and and there's a, there's a, a phrase that that um, I know Bettina has said before who's been on the show and, and others you know um, and and I think it's the tagline to your show Orlin so I'm going to use it anyway um, you know does your faith inform your politics or is, or is your politics you know controlling your faith and I think that as believers yes we should be engaged in in you know the the goings on of, of the day and and in politics but we have to be careful as far as what's driving us um, and and not misusing religion, not instrument not instrumentalizing it um, for an agenda. Um, and I'll leave it there. So I know Orlin has more to say on this. I think you're um, you're you're completely right on point. Um, when your agenda becomes personal, whether it's your personal politics or your personal point of view or your personal beliefs, then what ends up happening is there is a selfishness there that exists and the moment that selfishness exists, it really becomes unchristlike. And the idea of Christ was a lack of selfishness, that selflessness was what it's supposed to be about. And therefore, when you can get to a point where whatever my political beliefs are, that they trump my ability to love my fellow man who is different, then you've completely you know, distorted the whole Christian message. And I think one of the things that we have to always be cautious of is that we are called to impact the world, but not be of the world. And so we should be involved in the public square in conversation, but hopefully we're there with a strong enough, um, you know, fortitude that we're not just going to go out there and then become who they are, but instead be going out there to be impacting them to demonstrate who we are. And, and you know, and ironically, you know, um, as Jennifer was talking about how long our title is in public affairs and religious liberty. From a church perspective, we talk a lot about religious liberty. But the fact of the matter is the public affairs side of what we do is really what the Apostle Paul would do is you go out and you tell people who you are. You go out and you let them know, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar. You go out and let them know that, you know, when you are hungry, people are being fed. When you are sick, we have hopefully right health care for you. Because if you can make clear to people who you are, then it's a whole lot easier to have conversations about what your doctrinal beliefs are. No one wants to talk about your doctrinal beliefs if they have no idea who you are or where you come from or where you've been. Mm. And part of what our job is, is to first demonstrate where we've been and, what we, and why we are who we are. And then you might be interested in hearing about my doctrines at that point. You know, it's like Jesus would say, you know, I got to feed them before I can preach to them. You know, I've got to take care of their personal needs. And I think as Christians and as Adventists in particular, that's what we're called to do. And I, you know, I know sometimes this can even offend people, but I believe you've got to be a Christian first and an Adventist second. Because I'm not sure you can actually be a good Adventist and not already have been acting like a good Christian. Yeah. Uh, you, you that's actually before. something my dad used to tell us all the time when we were growing up, Orland. You're a Christian. And you are an Adventist, but you are a Christian. Wow. And when we talk about Christianity and being a, a reflection of Christ, I think back to that 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 news story that you shared with us, Jennifer, yeah. about the people on the plane. And it's like, what kind of impact and what kind of reflection were they leaving? You know, to try to make that a religious liberty issue or a religious freedom issue, 
I don't know if that's the Christ that I want to reflect to people as one who is um, obnoxious and not caring about offending those right. around me unnecessarily, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah. we, I think we have a duty in the freedom of religion that we have to also remember we're, we're, we're using it to reflect Christ and we're using it to try to show people who God is. And if we're leaving a sour taste in people's mouths, no, we really, you know, we're doing a disservice to the God that we say that we serve. Yeah, which is very different than if you were singing inside your church and people came in and told you to stop. Right. Um, so right. that's a, a completely different story. Um, you mentioned the Apostle Paul. One of the most shocking trips I've done is to the city of Corinth because it was much smaller than I expected. You know, they have excavations on the ancient Corinth, which is the first century Corinth. Mm -hmm. And the, the Bible says that Paul had with Aquila and Priscilla a booth, let's say a, a shop that they sold tents in and, and other stuff. And I thought the Agora was like a, a huge market. It isn't. You know, you've got like 20, the 20 spaces on one end and 20 spaces on the other end. It's, I would say, 300 feet end to end. It's not long. And at the end of it, at the Agora, was the epicenter of Corinth, you had the Bima, which was the place where the leaders were. And there is a, I think it's, it's a Hebrew inscription in one of the stones, which would have been Paul, uh, or some way of, of knowing uh, which one is likely to have been Paul's uh, shop, you know, with Aquila and Priscilla. And it was very close to the Bema. And we're talking about here between Paul's shop and the leaders of Corinth, 30 feet for two years, every day, which is what you're talking about, uh, Orlan. You know, the public affairs aspect of it is, is rubbing shoulders with, is being known in business. You don't communicate integrity in two weeks. Right. You know, right. you need a long time to demonstrate what you're made of, uh, especially in the 21st century, as we all move to the cities and we move and we know each other for not very long. So I I like that a lot. Uh, religious liberty can only truly be helped if you have a good public affairs strategy and yeah. you are known, which is similar to public relations. When I yeah. first arrived six years ago, I was like, hey, what's the difference? <clears throat> public relations and public affairs. You know, let's talk about that. So now I understand a lot better. And all of that is needed, um, especially when the crisis comes. Uh, do people know you before the crisis so that when it comes, they can stand up for you? That's that's an important question. Amen. Um, Jennifer, I'm so glad you brought up Daniel because when we look at the Bible, it's a, we always say, let's go to the Bible for the great examples. And so in the Bible, we have people who stood up for their faith, even against sort of government authorities. But if we go to the New Testament, there are so many texts that we all repeat over and over again. You know, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. And Romans, um, it says to be subject to governing authority. And First Peter again, submit yourselves to all um, government authority and every. And so, when we talk about balance, and as we wind up this conversation, Orlin and Jennifer, if we could talk, when you're talking to your members, when we talk to the people who are watching, how would you advise them to balance these 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 issues that say religious liberty is important and I need to protect it, but I also need to help and love and be a Christian and, and um, give up maybe something of me in order to let other people, where do we find that balance? Well, then let's start with you. And then Jennifer, we'll go to you. And then if you could pray for us. Well, I think one of the things that's important is that we all just have to realize that if you're going to have love for your fellow man, it's going to require some sacrifice on your part. The idea that you simply would like to see things happen in a way that's most comfortable for you is not necessarily the most Christ-like way to operate. You know, so in my opinion, I try to let people know that at the end of the day, we're still supposed to love one another. We can be different without having to be divided. You can be patriotic without having to be partisan. You know, there are just so many ways that you can live your life in which you can stand up for what you believe but you don't have to step upon your fellow man while you do so. And I think if we all understand that we can be who we'd like to be in Christ without not trying to be obnoxious or, or pushy to others, I think that's all God asks for us to do. And that's what I would tell most of our members. Hmm. Yeah. And to follow on with what Orland said, you know, I think believers and as Bible believers, you know, we know that 
one of the greatest gifts that God gave us was the gift of choice. He made us with the ability to choose to worship him or not to. And so realizing the gift of this choice, we should be making sure we promote it and defend it for all people, um, whether they believe the same things we do or they don't, because God has given us that choice, even though it meant that we had the choice to distance ourselves from him. So I hope that, that we cherish that, but we also defend it for all people, not just people that believe like we do. Amen. I think you asked me to, to close out with prayer, right? Yeah, if you could, please. Okay. Sure, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we want to thank you for this discussion, Lord. We want to thank you for this time that we were able to reflect on the great and, and beautiful gift that you gave us in making us um, in your image with the ability to choose and with the freedom of choice, Lord. And we ask that as we use this fundamental right, that we use it to glorify your name, to show love to others by not um, forcing them to believe as we do, but to be reflections of you such that people are only drawn to you and that they have no choice but to want to serve you, Lord. Lord, I ask you to be with each person that um, has uh, listened to this, this dialogue and that we reflect your love in all that we come in contact with. In your name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Orlin. Thank you, Sam, for being here. And for those who are watching, um, don't forget we are here to pray for you. We have our prayer warriors waiting to pray for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Sam and I are off next week but we'll be back after that. Have a great week. Bye.